Hello, everyone. <laughs> welcome. My name is Mark Vasquez. Uh, it is my pleasure to welcome you to Art and Influence, Don Coons, presented by the Cooper Union Alumni, uh, Office of Alumni Affairs. Uh, tonight's event honors a beloved member of the Cooper community, Don Coons, who served our school and its students from 1966 up until his untimely death in 2001. This evening is the latest iteration in a series of events in appreciation of Cooper Union faculty members, past and present. It is our collective hope that this is just the beginning of a series of regular events featuring other faculty honorees from across all the school's programs. The inaugural edition, which also honored Professor Coons, was hosted virtually in 2021 by the Cooper Union Alumni Association. I had the good fortune of introducing that event as well, that time in my capacity as chair of the CUAA Events Committee. The recording from that event is available on the Cooper Union YouTube channel, where tonight's proceedings will also be available in the near future. My thanks to Brian Lee Boyce and the rest of tonight's organizers for inviting me to be part of this evolution of this series. Uh, in case my Peter Cooper-like beard didn't give it away, I too am a Cooper alum. Uh, more specifically, I'm an engineering alum who spent most of his free time at the foundation building. So seeing us come together in an interdisciplinary fashion is all the more exciting to me. Before I forget, uh, just a reminder for you all to please mute your phones. And with that said, it is my pleasure to introduce you to your host for this evening, Kelly Acuso Zach. Hello, Kelly. Kelly is a School of Art graduate and an art and design professional with many years of experience in the fields of set design, window and visual display, and special events, including prop making, creative graphic display, and set design for the entertainment industry. She began her career as an art and design professional in the special events and event planning field and currently works as a special education teacher. In her volunteer capacity, Kelly serves as the Vice President of Alumni Activities for the CUAA, a role she has held for several years now. She's been responsible for organizing the annual holiday and block parties, coordinating the CUAA's involvement in the Student Harvest Feast, and has had a hand in many other alumni-focused activities. It should come as no surprise, then, that she was also the recipient of the 2023 CUAA Alumna of the Year Award. I've had the good fortune of knowing Kelly both during our time as students and, again, in our time as volunteers with the CUAA. So with that, please welcome Kelly accuses Zach. published by the Cooper Union and launched in 2023. Draw Poker, a folio of her drawings on the topic, also published by the Cooper Union, was released in 2008. Her widely exhibited works is held by museums in New York, Dallas, New Orleans, Philadelphia, and in private collections across the country. The exhibition Sue Ferguson Gussow, a retrospective of portraits, unoccupied clothing, and still lifes, took place in the Houghton Gallery of the Foundation Building in October and November of 2023. Sue Ferguson Gussow. Thank you, Kelly. You're welcome. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. I'm often getting very poor relationship with my... Uh, so, um, I came to know Don Kuhn's Pretty early in my tenure at Cooper, uh, he became my, my pal, my buddy. We uh, started first to know each other talking about some mutual students that we were either worried about or per particularly enjoyed. Uh, and then we slowly, or not so slowly, became close friends. Uh, you're seeing now a drawing I did of Don uh, when he came to visit me one weekend, oh, long, long ago, 
uh, and uh, he was reading the New York Times. I'm sure it was the art section. Uh, and uh, actually, I had just been through a rather bad breakup, so he was my New Year's date. <laughs> and uh, we would, we were friends enough at that point to be always telling each other our woes as well as our happy stories. Uh, and so I can't really say that we influenced each other as artists because when we met, we were already, we were young artists, but we were still very uh, much into what we were going to be doing. He being an abstract expressionist and I being a figurative artist. Uh, and maybe, of course, we influenced each other in the sense that friends influence each other. Uh, talking about art, uh, both being particularly uh, reverent of uh, Edgar Degas. Uh, those of you who know Don well enough were sometimes treated to the, looking at that folio he had, that very, very special edition of uh, Prince of Degas um, that was done in the early 19th in the early 20th century, but a very, very special uh, group of, of prints. Uh, and so I'm showing you actually a series of drawings of dresses, unoccupied dresses, uh, because I thought that in some way related to uh, the art of calligraphy, uh, which is so akin to the art of drawing and, uh, and in that sense has a kind of commonality with uh, the work, the beautiful, beautiful work that Don did in his painting. Um, and we both, of course, were very supportive of each other's work and liked to uh, have studio visits and discuss uh, what he was painting, what I was drawing and painting. Uh, and so I don't know that Don would have seen these particular drawings. I think they perhaps come after he died. Uh, the dresses belong to the woman in the drawing here uh, who was a principal dancer for, uh, for Balanchine. She was also a very close friend of his. Her name is Karin, was sadly, her name was Karin van Aroldingen. And uh, I didn't know that at the time that I asked her to pose for me. I had no idea that she was such an important dancer. Um, so I asked her if she would pose and she said, yes, yeah, sure and uh, brought along that fantastic dress, uh, which she now stands in the drawing uh, in front of a big mirror I have in my studio. Uh, so all this, I guess, to say that um, Don was a kind of role model for me because I thought if anyone ever were a real artist, a committed artist, devoted artist, it was Don Kuhn's. And uh, it was an inspiration to me in that way uh, that, that he lived in the work that he did. And that in that sense, uh, I know for many of you, he was also such an important teacher and an inspiration, but, uh, and he lived in that way too and lives on uh, and I guess I would conclude by saying it was an honor to be his friend and an honor to be here, therefore, with all of you. Thank you, Professor Cassel. Next up, we have uh, Robert O'Connor. He is a multidisciplinary artist whose paintings, prints, and videos have been exhibited in New York City, across the US, and in Japan. Robert holds both a bachelor's and a master's degree in engineering from the Cooper Union, and a master's from the Vermont College of Fine Arts. He studied music composition at the Juilliard Extension and attended the European American Musical Alliance residency in Paris in 2016. 
Robin is a co-founder, creator of Film One Fest, the international one-minute film festival, and served as, as its creative director for 10 years. He's participated in several film festivals, including the Chicago Underground Film Festival and the Provincetown International Film Festival. His music video, Burning Cathedrals, was a selection at the 2022 Can Short Film Festival. Robert also sits on the boards of AH Arts, a local arts organization helping to grow and sustain creative communities. Robert O'Connor. I am one of those rare creatures, the adventurous engineering student, that ventured across 8th Street to explore the offerings of the art school. I thought, since I had little drawing and painting experience, writing was something I could do, so I registered for calligraphy. Don, Don seemed tickled that I had wandered into his class, where I would stay for the next three years. Uh, some examples I did in Don's class. Um, as the semesters went by, I started to feel less in interested in my engineering courses and drawn more and more toward art. In my junior year, I told my parents I wanted to drop out and go to art school. Uh, parents' nightmare, I'm sure. They were stunned. <laughs> After a long, hard talk, they had convinced me to finish my engineering studies, which I did. Feeling like this was my destiny, I dove into research, went on to get my master's in engineering, and got hired by an environmental engineering company. I had convinced myself that I was doing something important. As the years went on, I remained close to Don. He would take on the role of mentor, taking me to galleries and museums and critiquing the paintings I had started to make. We went to the Art Institute of Chicago, the Phillips Collection in Washington, the Barnes in Philadelphia, and countless galleries in New York, searching out his favorites, Bonnard, Diebenkorn, de Kooning among them. At this point, my engineering career was progressing. I was moving up the ladder and getting deeper in. And then one fateful day, around my 28th birthday, Don said this to me. If you don't leave your job now and focus on art, you will never truly be happy. That simple, painful truth, sorry, spoken to me at that moment it was the pivot point of my life. Within a year, I would leave my job and start working toward becoming the person I am today. I would go back to art school win the McDowell Grant from the Art Students League of New York, and even teach Don's beloved calligraphy class when he went on sabbatical. In 2004, I entered the MFA program at Vermont College of Fine Arts. These are two paintings that I made as part of my entrance portfolio. In graduate school, I started making videos, which would become an important part of my practice. In 2008, I had a solo exhibition at New York Studio Gallery that included paintings and a video installation. The video work led me to co-found Film One Fest, a one-minute film festival in New Jersey, and I would serve as its director for 10 <coughs> years. The video work led me to study music composition at Juilliard, which led to other videos and scoring projects, including Burning Cathedral, which was selected for the Con Shorts Film Festival in 2022. <laughs> Finally, I am passionate about making art accessible and building creative communities. I serve on the board of AH Arts and chair its exhibitions committee and serve as its treasurer. I know Don would be proud of this work. And this is the Arts Council. I live a wonderful, chaotic, creative life, and I am so grateful to Don for opening up the world of art to me, for his patience, his friendship, and for saying those faithful words to me all those years ago. 
So sometime in the mid 90s, Don asked if I would help him in the studio and stretch some canvases. As you probably know, he liked to paint large. And if my memory is correct, it was oil primed linen, which was heavy and stiff. By the third day of stretching, I started to cramps in my arms and hands, and I could barely hold the canvas pliers. Don was grateful and I think felt a bit badly about my hands. So he brought out a pile <laughs> of um, oil pastels and he told me to pick three of them. Um, this is one of them. And I brought it with me here tonight. I um, had been wanting to get it reframed, so I uh, took it out of the frame and if anyone's interested to look at it, it's here. So thank you very much. Thank you, Robert. Harlan Levine is our next speaker. He, has, he attended Cooper Union from 1977 through 1984, studying in all three schools, engineering, art, and architecture. He graduated with a bachelor's in architecture. He also studied architecture at the University of Texas, graduating with a post-professional master's of architecture. After working for years in construction, fine woodworking, furniture design and fabrication, and related fields, he started his own architecture and design firm with clients and projects around the country and overseas. His firm, HMLA Architecture, I don't think I said that right, based in Austin, Texas, provides full architectural services and specializing in environmentally conscious, sustainable design, and green construction. As an academic and author, Harlan has lectured at numerous universities and professional seminars covering a range of architectural theory, criticism, and policy. Harlan Levine. Harlan is actually joining us on video. A pre-recorded video that he made ready for tonight.
I took that class every single semester for the rest of my time at Cooper Union, and it was the best decision I made there. I never was the most talented, the most committed, or the best calligrapher there, but my growth as an artist, an architect, and a person had a lot to do with Don Thune. He could have been teaching poetry, painting, cooking, or just about anything else, and it would have been wonderful. But he taught calligraphy, which he loved, and I think every one of his students also came to love. Attending his parties in his loft, to which I always brought a pineapple for some reason, <laughs> where I finally got to see his paintings, was another revelation to me. Your teacher is an abstract painter, I remember him telling us. It took me by surprise. But when I saw some, and they are glorious, I began to understand. His influence on my architecture was profound. Not that I used calligraphic lettering with my drawing, though I tried that once and quickly realized how silly that was. <laughs> but he encouraged me to bring him some of my more abstract projects and discuss my drawings, which he would give a knowing appraisal nod to look me in the eyes, enlarge by his lenses to make sure that I got the message. Once I had seen the moon, there was no going back. My artist friend and I remain friends even today. We still invoke the memory of whom we imitate his voice and mannerisms to each other, meaning no disrespect but the opposite, our reverence for his memory and what he gave us. Until being a part of this today, there was no one else who would understand that. And so I feel privileged to have been invited here to share a few of my little memories with kindred folk. Thank you. Thank you, Harlan. Next, we have Jerry Kelly. Jerry is a calligrapher, book designer, and type designer. Before starting his own design business in 1998, Kelly was vice president of the Stein Hour Press. His voice, I'm sorry, his work has been honored numerous times and his book designs have been selected more than 30 times for the AIGA 50 Books of the Year. In 2015, he was presented with the 28th Gowdy Award from Rochester Institute of Technology. Jerry has served as chairman of the American Printing History Association, president of the Typophiles, and an uh, active member of several committees at the Grolio, Grolio Club. He has written many articles as well as several books on calligraphy, typography, including The Noblest Roman, The Centaur Types, and most recently, Type Revivals. Jerry Kelly. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. What a beautiful name. <laughs> and thank you, Brian, for all your work organizing this and for inviting me to join. Unlike others who are speaking tonight and who spoke in the previous symposium, my first calligraphy teacher was not Don Kunz, and I did not attend Cooper Union. But rather, I first studied calligraphy with Don's colleague, Dennis Lund, at Queens College. Both men were from Portland, Oregon. Both shared a passionate regard for Eastern art and philosophy, and both were inspiring teachers. Another distinction is that unlike Kunz's other students who concentrated on graphic design, painting, drawing, or some other area, I concentrated on the art of the book, which is something I had in common with Don, whose substantial library reflected his abiding respect for books. Notably, I collaborated with him on a book project, which I will speak about later. After graduating Queens in 1976, I first worked in advertising for a year and then as a professional calligrapher for three and a half years, but I longed to work as a book designer. Eventually, I got my big break when I became the assistant to Burt Clark at the Press of A. Kolisch in Mount Vernon, New York. I learned a great deal there, and after a decade at Kolisch, I moved on to work for the competition, the Steinauer Press, the premier fine book printer in the United States. This is the first job I did for Steinauer. It was a calligraphic holiday alphabet greeting. After that, I went out on my own, which was over 25 years ago. Back in the late 70s, I had an idea for a small pamphlet on the great Renaissance calligrapher Ludovico Origi and a printer he collaborated with, Antonio Blato. The combination of the arts of calligraphy and the book 
through fine printing resonated with me. A classmate from Dennis and Don's calligraphy classes, Stephen Winterton, and I started a small private press together, with the Origi and Blatto being our first project. Down the rabbit hole I went, to the point where my basement is now filled with over 450 cases of metal type <laughs> and four obsolete letter presses, <laughs> along with other paraphernalia used in letterpress printing. Still, I frequently include calligraphy in my design work, such as this program for a church concert and this poster for an exhibition of calligraphy which I curated for the Grolier Club. I've worked with many rare book dealers. Designing catalogs for them has become something of a specialty for me. I'm going to run through some other book designs. Um, but a lot, of, a lot of my work is done for rare book dealers. And occasionally, I incorporate calligraphy in that work also, such as this <coughs> cover for a book catalog for a Boston rare book dealer. While concentrating on book design, calligraphy is still my first love and we never forget our first love. So I've always kept my fingers, or at least my pens, in calligraphy ink, creating lettering for the occasional personal holiday cards, such as the Ruskin quotation on the left, or just a unique project for my own edification, such as the Einstein quote on the right. And all the while, every year, I print a few items by hand from handset metal type at the Kelly Winterton Press. One letterpress project is particularly relevant to today's tributes to Don. Sometime around 1976, Don introduced me to Vincent Fitzgerald, an art dealer who would soon delve into publishing fine illustrated books, and his friend Zarei Pratovi, a translator of Persian poetry, including the writings of Yahud and Muhammad Rumi, who at the time few in the West knew of. As a team, we worked on a long, roomy poem, The Story of the Parrot and the Merchant, with Don as artist. The book pushed the limits of what we were capable of, but we succeeded in completing 60 copies, handset and printed letterpress on Reeves' paper. I know that Don remained extremely proud of this publication. Vincent Fitzgerald went on to produce an impressive run of over 60 fine editions, many of which are in major institutions including the Library of Congress in Washington, Lyric Cabinetta in Munich, and Columbia University, where the archive of his company resides, including Don's drawings for the Rumi. A few years later, in, 1990, in 1979, there was a strange concordance of events, some might even say alignment of the stars, when I had the privilege of taking a calligraphy class with Hermann Zaff. It turned out that, quite coincidentally, Zaff and I had the same flight from Rochester to LaGuardia Airport. I invited Zaff on the spur of the moment to see Don. Kunz wasn't thrilled with the impromptu unplanned visit, but he was certainly happy to meet and speak with the master calligrapher. Always the teacher, with great pride, he pulled out student work from his flat files, not his own work, to show Zaff. A lasting friendship with Herman was an honor which I could never have dreamed of when I was a calligraphy student of Don Kunz at Queens College in the 1970s. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. Next, we have Meliz Keefe. Uh, Meliz is going to join us from uh, Newfoundland. She's uh, learned to draw and paint at a young age while studying at the Art Students League in New York City. A graduate of the Cooper Union, her work has been exhibited in solo and group shows both in the U.S. and Canada. Originally from New Jersey, Meliz spent years w living and working in wilder, more remote places, including the Great Plains in Nebraska and the high desert of the Rocky Mountains in Ta Taos, New Mexico. In 2013, she was awarded a residency on Fogel Island, Newfoundland, where she settled for good in the house she built with her husband. Melissa's work has been extensively exhibited in solo and group shows in New York City, Boston, Newfoundland, Canada, Connecticut, and New Mexico, as well as having had appear in the media and periodicals since 1991. Melissa Keefe. Meliz has a pre-recorded video that she wanted to deliver from her studio. Really wonderful. Let's, let's 
such an honor. Some of the more special moments in my life were from Cooper Union. Professors I did have there were Irvin Petlin, Mark Sacano, Steve Posen, with whom I'm still in touch with. And within the last two years at Cooper Union, I had the wonderful professors who I kind of call my luminaries who make for a really, really impressive last two years at Cooper Union for me and had to kind of springboard into my life as a teacher. Of course, Don Coates was um, one of the more important people in my life then. Let me tell you a little bit about my studio. I am in Newfoundland. Um, the island is the northernmost island of all Canada, so the very, very regional. Let's just see a little bit of um, my studio, some of my paintings. Um, go around, around. You can see my palette, which is kind of like a very busy, very, very busy palette. Um, and I'm just going to show you what's outside my door, and then we'll talk about Don Cook. Maria Judice, 
For three decades, creative teams and business leaders have sought the provocative vision and mentorship of Maria Judis. After founding the pioneering experience design firm Hot Studio and leading global teams at Facebook and Autodesk, Maria's mission today is to build the next generation of creative leaders. Through one-on-one -on -one coaching, group coaching, and team building workshops, Maria unlocks the potential hidden in executives and the people they lead. A popular speaker at design and business conferences, Maria is the author, author of four design books, including Rise of the DEO, Leadership by Design, and Change Makers, How Leaders Can Design Change in an Insanely Complex World. Mar Maria Judis. Thank you. It, first of all, it's like warms my heart to see you all here today. This is amazing. Okay, so, <laughs> as an artist growing up in Staten Island, I felt confident and special. I stood out. But when I got accepted to Cooper Union in 1981, and I was amongst my peers in the art community, I suffered from tremendous anxiety attacks. I was terribly insecure, and I felt like I wasn't good enough to be here. I truly believe that I was the last picked person to have been accepted into Cooper Union. <laughs> For four years, I felt that. <laughs> At Cooper, I took calligraphy classes with Professor Kunz. He was a kind man with a calm, reassuring voice. Walking into his calligraphy class was like entering a church, the Church of Don Coons, the Church of Acceptance. When entering his class, my anxiety would melt away, and it just felt like a safe place to just be. He was the Buddha of Cooper Union. He had a mindfulness about him that made you want to study and work hard. Don Coons taught us the importance of practicing mastery and focusing on our craft. In calligraphy, flow, accuracy, and details matter. Don Coons enabled us to aspire to be great through commitment to craft and the quality of work. I remember like it was yesterday. We all sat down at our respective desks that were tilted on an angle. And he began the class by quietly and care we began the class by quietly and carefully measuring pen widths and drawing our guidelines to do our work. We all taped down our jars of Higgins Eternal black ink and underneath our bean fang graphics paper, we placed blotter paper to ensure an optimum writing surface for our Mitchell pen nibs. Professor Coons would start the class speaking quietly, yet slowly and methodically, making letter forms using the long end of the chalk at the correct angle, appropriate to the hand we were studying and then the room turned silent while we spend the remaining three hours practicing letter forms over and over again. And you could hear a pin drop. When Professor Coons felt like you mastered a hand, he would introduce you to another one. I pushed myself practicing for hours and hours. And I felt much more comfortable in calligraphy class than in design class. So I would often use calligraphy as a bridge between art and design. And I was told that this piece that I did in his class, an infographic of the Garden of Earthly Delights, landed me my first job working for Richard Saul Werman at Access Press designing maps and guidebooks. Don Coons never judged me. He gave me permission to be different. And he helped me find my authentic voice as an artist and as a designer. 
Years later, I went on to become a creative director in my mid-20s, leading teams to producing outstanding work. And if you look at my work closely, you can clearly see how calligraphy has continued to influence my design work with that same commitment to quality, accuracy, and craft. When I moved to the Bay Area for a job there, I worked for several years as a cartographer combining design with technology. I also designed and produced some of the first websites at the beginning of the early internet age experimenting and discovering the new medium of communication. And over the course of my over 35 year career as a designer, I've developed a clear and authentic point of view around the power of design, applying design in new ways to solving problems. I've co-authored several books on this topic. But, the very last lesson Don Coons has taught me, and probably the most important one, is to be kind, compassionate, and care about people. On numerous occasions, I broke down and cried in his class from the sheer pressure and stress. Art school was hard, and my parents were struggling to stay together in an unhappy marriage. It was hard to keep things together, and I wasn't the only person struggling. Lots of tears were shed in that class. Don Coons held space for people. I believe that the best leaders are those that are there to hold you and lift you up, especially when you're down. Don Coons provided a sanctuary of safety, which allowed me to carry on and persevere. I became that kind of empathetic leader as I grew my company to be one of the most successful experienced design companies in the Bay Area and in New York City. I created an atmosphere where people can do their best work and be authentically different. After selling my company and then after working in corporate America for a few years, I returned to that idea of lifting people up by working as an executive coach a spiritual advisor, and a teacher. Carrying these life lessons forward and now coming full circle, I credit Don Coons with the person that I have become. He was, without doubt, one of the most influential people in my life and career. Professor Coons. I know that you are looking down, smiling at us right now. Oh. On behalf of your students everywhere, we sit in gratitude for all that you've contributed as a teacher, as an artist, and as an incredible human being. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Brian Lee Boyce is a multidisciplinary graphic designer, having worked in print, television, film production, digital and motion graphics, as well as practicing artist, recently focusing on portrait drawings and graphite with chalk. Brian's graphic design portfolio includes work for the Walker Arts Center in Minneapolis, the Public Theater in New York City, CBS Television, Nickelodeon, Workman Publishing, Chanticleer Press, Sony Pictures, Universal Studios, Netflix, Amazon, and HBO Max. Brian is the acting director of the estate of the artist Don Coons, a gallery assistant at Skidmore Contemporary Art in Palm Beach, Palm Desert, California, and the marketing chair for Toastmasters International District 12, as well as a member of the 829 Local of IATSE, the International Association of Theater and Stage Employees since 2015, Brian Lee Boyce. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you for the introduction, and thank you all for being here. Thank you, Cooper Union, for an exciting, multifaceted career in visual communication. This is my website. 
My work in film and TV is my greatest achievement so far. Whether you see it in the background or front and center, graphic design has an important role to play in cinema and the way its stories are told. As always, the measure of value in visual communication always comes down to clarity and legibility, essential for communication without friction. Whether educating an audience, promoting a product, or telling a story, the value of good design is measured by clarity, legibility, and simplicity. To be understandable is to be understood. To communicate is to be human. To communicate with compassion is to be humane. Tonight, we celebrate the art and influence of Don Kuhns, who I studied calligraphy with at the end of my senior year and then became friends with after graduating for 11 years until his sudden death in August of 2001. Questions have been asked regarding the fate of Don's paintings on canvas and works on paper. And the good news is the collection is excellent condition due to the great, and I do mean great efforts of Dennis Lund, who was Jerry Kelly's first calligraphy instructor, who graduated from the Cooper Union School of Art, 1965, who has maintained and archived and kept safe the entire collection of Don's works on canvas, his works on paper, and his collection of books. I've been collaborating with Dennis for the past few years, and together we're working on presenting Don's work in a manner consistent with its quality at the level of respect the work deserves. We're doing everything in our power to bring the work Don prolifically created for decades into the light and visibility it rightly warrants. First things first is building a solid digital footprint, beginning with a Wikipedia page that includes his exhibition history, collections records, and a bibliography. I'm not sure if Don would approve of having an Instagram account, but I have given him <laughs> at Don Kuhn's artist. A Facebook page and a Facebook group dedicated to Don are fully activated. And online is a website for Don, donkuhnsestate.com, that highlights Don's work. And if you keep in touch, join the mailing list, or just check in on the social media pages, we'll be moving forward with updates about the next phase, which is the most exciting phase yet, which is a monograph. To create a published monograph that we can use to share his work with galleries, curators, with collectors, and with you. I have the great privilege of working with Mr. Jerry Kelly, book designer extraordinaire. A round of applause, yes. And it will, yes. And it will serve us as a catalog. Raisonne will have a, a hundred color plates, uh, three, 4,000 word essay to talk about the development of Don's work, his inspiration, his influences, and what his influence has been as attested to tonight. But what Don left us with is more than a book, uh, more than a collection of works on canvas, works on paper. What's important to keep in mind is that Don left us with a community, a fellowship, not devoted to him particularly, but what I feel his work represents, which are the values that he stood for, that he effectively professed. These are the values that bring us together. These are the values that are worth standing for, they're worth living for, and that's why it's especially great to see us all together tonight to celebrate his legacy, the present moment, and to build a vision for the future. Thank you for joining us. We are moving into a lightly moderated uh, format, but before we do, we have a five minute audio clip that was recorded in 1977 for WBAI radio by Cooper Union School of Art graduate and world-class calligrapher Bernard Maisner, who is here with us tonight. And I just wanted <laughs> a round of applause. If 
ever there is a model of success as a calligrapher, it is absolutely Bernard Mazur. So it is wonderful to have you here. And so great that you were able to uh, uh, revitalize this piece of audio. We'll put the full 45 minutes on the website so uh, folks can listen in. And uh, Mike, our audio visual wizard, if you would set up the uh, audio. Oh, thank you, buddy. Perhaps we could start by having you give us a brief definition of what calligraphy is as you perceive it. Calligraphy is writing, <coughs> whatever else it is, it's writing. The, uh, the word means beautiful writing, so uh, it's wrong to say good or bad calligraphy. Uh, it's the use of a tool to communicate. Beautiful has been removed from so much of what we wear or have around us, what we eat from, the, uh, our surroundings. The beautiful is not only the luxurious, it's the true, it's the appropriate, it's what all people should have. To learn to write legibly is to be patient and persevering. Those are virtues that are not always plentiful. It means paying attention and doing what you should be doing without encouraging distraction. To be a professor is, is an honor distinguishes those who, who have studied a 
and who are committed to study, and who want to study along with others. Thank you, Bernard for asking Don the question to begin with and for getting it all on tape and for pulling it out of storage after Hurricane Sandy destroyed your home. Thank you. To move into a, a lightly moderated dialogue uh, uh, amongst us, I first wanted to start, I'm just so, so grateful that we are all together and how remarkable that the group of us uh, can re represent uh, Cooper students from uh, before Don's time, but Sue, you were Don's teaching colleague. Jerry, you did not go to Cooper Union, but you were a student from a separate school and you're still here. And you also worked with Don in a professional capacity. Uh, Robert attended uh, the engineering school twice, in fact. Uh, so not just an art student. Uh, Maria, solid art student, rock star. Kelly, who I was in the same year as, who actually, Kelly, I spoke with you years ago to see if you had any ideas about how we could uh, uh, honor Don, and it was your idea that we should bring it to the Alumni Association, so thank you for that because it helped us set up the online uh, YouTube um, uh, conversation that we had in 2021. And thank you, Helen Freeman and Jennifer Durst for your hospitality and for having us here. What I would like to do is not talk too much, but uh, if we could bring uh, Liz Keefe uh, up from the world of technology. If the technology gods are with us, there is Meliz. She is in Newfoundland and she's able to join us. Um, and I wanted to start, Meliz, when you and I were talking on the phone, you mentioned having a, a special anecdote that you would like to share uh, during a visit to New York when you popped in on Don. If you would like to share that with us, it would be fantastic. Sure. Can you, we hear, can you yeah. hear me okay? Perfect. 100%. Well, <clears throat> when we were talking uh, on Zoom the other day, um, the last time I, I saw Don was in the late 90s. And uh, I was coming back to visit and I gave him a call and and he said, come come to his loft and, and we'll have lunch. And um, on the way there, I stopped at, at, at a bodega and I um, bought this beautiful um, large group of sunflowers, large big faces. And uh, I went into his building and went up the elevator. And uh, uh, this is all confirmed because um, Brian actually told me this is because in my memory, I didn't know, but I believed I, it was an, the elevator that went up and the elevator doors opened. and. And there was Don, and he looked at me, and, and uh, we just just beaming and 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 happy. And uh, he looked at he looked at flowers, and um, he said, "Come in." And he he brought me over to uh, this table, I recall, with lots of windows around it. And there was, <clears throat> and I knew this from back in college. He always had flowers, so I thought he'd love my flowers. But there was a a vase, a large vase of um, sunflowers <laughs> on his table. And they were just about at the moment of having to be taken away and, and uh, renewed. And there I was bringing in the sunflowers that he needed to put into the vase and take out the old sunflowers. So it was just a moment, a beautiful moment. Um, for me and that last time I was with him and, and the sunflowers. And um, just one more, one more quick anecdote and then, then I'll be through because this just happened last night. <clears throat> um, I was in my studio and I sleep 
at my studio at night sometimes. <clears throat> and I've had a, I've had a kind of a, a sad week for certain things. And I was very, 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 I had a lot of anxiety last night before I went to bed. And, and I was very, very sad. Um, someone here had just passed away, a, a friend of a friend of mine and friend to the island here, and, and it was very important. And and Brian, I got your tape, the tape of, of Don Kunz. And I thought to myself, as I was going to sleep, and I was very, very upset, I thought, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna turn on the the conversation with Don Kunz. And it was so beautiful because I went to sleep to Don Kunz's voice last night. And it was very beautiful. Thank you so much, Melez. Thank you. You're and thank you all. This is really great. And Maria, it's great to see you and everybody else on the panel. And, and um, Sue Gassau, you were never my teacher, but uh, I, I could have taken you. <laughs> so it's just beautiful <laughs> to be here with all of you. Thank you. All right, we'll have a few more questions. Not too many, because we, we don't have all that much time, but uh, we'll try to get you back on the screen again um, to uh, keep That's you okay. included. Okay, don't go away. Okay. Uh, Sue, do we, do you, you, you seem taken by surprise, I'm sorry. Um, well, I'll just put it out uh, to the floor to, uh, does anybody have an anecdote? you would like to share that m might pertain to life either uh, inside or outside of Cooper? I want to hear more stories from Sue and Don. I want to know <laughs> what's going on there. Okay, uh, a memory. Uh, as some of mic. you may know, are you hearing me? Yeah, uh, yeah. As some of you may know, uh, Don had a, a list of people, I think I wasn't the only one, I'm sure, uh, that he would call to say Happy New Year on New Year's Day, right? I felt like the year could not begin without Don's phone call. And uh, I think of him every New Year's Day. I miss that voice that called up to wish Happy New Year and have a little chat. Uh, one time when I was feeling very bitter about something, oh, he asked me, right, he asked me if I had a New Year's wish or something like that. And I said, yeah, I'm wishing for a mean heart. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, oh, he said in that Don's soft voice, oh, you don't really mean that. And I said, oh, yes, I do, Don. <laughs> and I wish one for you, too. <laughs> well, of course, we all know what an impossibility that was ever going to be. Very true. Don had, uh, uh, in many ways, Don had a very pure heart, which yes. uh, uh, I think is why I uh, feel so emotional uh, about his loss. He was an excellent friend. We would have lots of uh, phone calls. He believed in telepathy, which was great. Uh, you know, that was before we had wireless internet and no one believed in telepathy or consciousness, but uh, I, I, I won't digress. Um, Maria. I th I, I, well, we are telepathic, so yes. Uh, but okay, great. I was hoping we could get back to the um, to the montage. So thank you, Mike and Lucas and Ray, our excellent wizard and assistant wizards in the AV booth. Thank you so much. Uh, d does anyone think of anything else that they want to I share? Uh, while we're here, this is our chance. This is our moment. I just. Um
Melissa was talking about her being a messy artist. And the other thing I, I find really curious, uh, and I struggle with this too as an artist and as a designer, is it's almost like there's two worlds. Like there's the world of calligraphy, which is this really exacting, methodical um, practice of you know clarity and accuracy. And then I look at these incredible paintings that are emotional and not that way. And I'm just, I, I, I find it really interesting that he was able to hold both of these um, qualities. Yeah. And so it's not as much of a story, it's just an observation. And I find it really funny because when I think about modern calligraphy today, it's more like this. Modern calligraphy is much more expressive like this. And I'm wondering if he would have evolved his thinking where he would have accepted modern calligraphy as calligraphy or that he would just put it aside and say, no, that's art. So that's just something that came to mind for me. I think he would say, no, that's all right. That's not really <laughs> that's calligraphy, right. but, 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 that's not, but that's just me. Uh, um, what comes to mind for me is being a senior at Cooper, there's a lot of responsibility for students at Cooper to perform and to make work that is valuable and uh, important and means something. And I was crippled with anxiety in calligraphy especially. And Don could see that. And I said, but I just feel so responsible. And he said, he said, let's not worry about the responsibility right now. Let's just concentrate on drawing the letter forms. <laughs> and I said, I said, but it's so hard for me to concentrate on what's going on in front of me because there's so much going on in my head. And it, 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 it opened a door for me that uh, helped me understand uh, who he was and a little bit about who I was because he, he said, it is insidious and I have been there. So that he could relate to my struggle and my frustration with performing and as a student uh, really helped me get through that class a lot. And to my classmate, Allison, Kate Lellis, you remember Allison, who was a vegetarian before we really had vegetarians then. And, and he, said, he said, Allison, you're not killing a small animal. You're drawing a letter form. <laughs> <laughs> we could, uh, uh, um, yes. Yeah, I could tell a, please. a short anecdote. Please. Uh, if you'll indulge me. Um, I remember I, I came to class once with some work that I wasn't particularly happy with, and I was, I was like pinching it, and I put it down. And Don slammed his hand on the, on the desk. And he said, how do you expect anyone to respect your work if you don't? And I always remember that to this day because it wasn't about perfection. It was about reverence. You know, like, yeah. you know, be respectful to, to your art and to what you're trying. And don't expect perfection. But, you know. Yeah. Beautiful yes. paper. It was like it was like, you know. I, and I still have paper to this day that I can't write on. That I'm really kind of blessed. <laughs> Jerry, when you took calligraphy, you studied with Dennis Lund, and then eventually worked with Don. Dennis. Dennis taught the. Just come right into oh. the mic. Oh, I, I think it's on. Just. Come closer okay. so it catches. Dennis up. taught the first term, and Don taught the second, third, fourth term at Queens College. And in many ways, they were very similar, and they had similar backgrounds. And that respect for Eastern philosophy, Eastern art, pervaded both. And as a calligraphy student, you were studying what else? Art. You were studying art Art also. and art history. My, I, I was an art major. Oh. And I was going to switch to be an art history major. I actually did better in art history. I loved art history. Absolutely loved it.
loved it. And uh, but I love uh, fine art also. But then I got the bug for calligraphy, and um, that's that. Yes. That is that. Also, the the holding of the pen. I remember Don pointing out that uh, that there there is a lightness to the holding of the pen that gives you control because you are not mangling the tool as you move it across the page. And to be able to relax and help the work be part of the problem, I mean, be, be the solution to the problem, not the problem itself. And he would always say, I was a terrible calligrapher, but he would always say, you're the ones who have to do the work. I'm just here to sugarcoat the pill. Um, when I took his class, studied, uh, he was very measured, his voice, which would, I am so, uh, taking in that recording, which is a, a treasure. Coming close to the mic. Yeah. Yeah. That recording is a treasure tonight to hear. Um, he invited all of us back to his studio, and you know, I, I think that maybe uh, Maybe grab, Mar grab Maria's mic. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> so um, I'm thinking he's one way, and then I walked, I think he, I do remember the elevator opening up into his loft, and all of a sudden his work just exploded. I mean, and I, I just, I couldn't even speak while I was there. Mm -hmm. Just the work just overwhelmed me. And it was just such an amazing experience to have a professor and who I thought was one way, and all of a sudden I saw his kind of instructional work. And to this day, It was a special place. Yeah. Well, here's the thing: we have to we, we have to uh, photograph it before we can print it because it needs to hold together as a collection. But uh, the pieces that you see uh, uh, on the montage, we might be running out of time. But uh, the pieces that you see uh, on the montage, I met with. Dennis Lund last May, and we photographed those, and they constitute about 40 pieces that are, let's say, 30 inches by 40 inches. So um, I could put those together. Also, I have a new batch of works on paper, similar to the pieces that you have, Robert. So I could put those online, and you can, uh, you can take a look at those. Because the website is a work in progress, so I can uh, photograph those and add those as we go. And then uh, they could be available to you and to us. I think that would be, that would be, that would be fantastic. Oh, oh uh, I have a good story. Not that I want to talk too much, but I was coming in to see Professor Gusso's show, Sue Gusso's show, in November, and I had been talking to Helen and Jennifer about the possibility of, of setting up an event like this at about that time. Uh, I'd spoken to Maria, and I thought, wouldn't it be amazing with Don have, being such a fan of Sugasso, if she would be able to come and speak at the event. So I come up the stairs, and there's Professor Gusso in her hat in front of the elevator, and I said, I'm gonna have to go say hello right now. And, and, uh, and so thank you for coming to uh, be with us. It really, it really means a lot. Yeah, as in meant to be. As in meant to be. I mean, what are the chances? I haven't seen you since 1990. I don't know when I last saw Bernie, and yeah. You remember Bernie? Of yes. course. Yes, of course. Absolutely. Of course, yes. How and, could I and, not? And Harlan was your, was your student and also. Har yeah, and, and uh, Stephen Mullins. And w while we're doing uh, shout outs, uh, Vincent Fitzgerald, our publisher, and uh, uh, Zara, Zara is here also. I'm not pronouncing Zara's name properly, but uh, they are here also, so that is really amazing. Um, does anybody have anything else that they want to uh, add? No? Okay. Well, um, we're at 7.54. Dear, are there any questions from the audience? I have a, I have a taker. Do you want to? Uh, I'll give you my mic. I can talk loud. Okay. We'll, we'll have you on the mic, then we can have you and the record. Thank you, Mark. 
I had Don Coons in 83, 84. I was not a good calligrapher. But I happen to own a very small painting by him. So maybe you can let me know how I can share that with you if you're collecting images of his work. Okay, sure. Yes. Yes. Go. Okay, sure. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. We can we'll share. Sh we'll share. Yeah. Hi, I, uh, my name is Don Bolognese. I, I went to Cooper, and I taught at Cooper. Hi, Sue. Hey. Anyway, uh, I was teaching, uh, I was, I was uh, uh, illustrating and doing book jackets and so on. In 1960, Fritz Eichenberg called, um, called me from Pratt. They had, they had uh, needed a a lettering teacher. So I went there and I, and I taught a whole course on book design that I had learned from people like Phil Grushkin and Paul Standard here back in the early, well, I don't know, the 50s and 60s, I forget. I graduated in 54. So anyway, I'm 90. So wow. <laughs> yeah, I'm a living, I'm, <laughs> and I, I'm happy to say that I'm still uh, working. And uh, I had a little anecdote about Don. So they called me at, um, and they said, I, it was like 1967. They lost a the calligraphy teacher. They had two. Don was one, and I forget who the other guy was. Yeah, maybe. So anyway, they lost. <laughs> he left. So they got in touch with me, and they pulled me out of Pratt. I had a very successful course going there on, on, book, on total book design, calligraphy, illustration, binding, and everything else. But I mean, you know. Cooper calls, I gotta go. So, um, so I come here and uh, I find out that what I'm making, and I don't remember how, but it was more than Don. So I went to the office and I said, I'm not gonna get this unless he gets it. I know my niece is here too, she's a, she went to Cooper, she said, don't, Don, don't say that story. It comes out, you know, like, but it was, it was like Don was too, he was always very modest. You know, he was devoted to his work. I, it wasn't that I was trying to prove anything, it's just that I felt it was fair, and I knew about his work, and I knew what a great calligrapher he was, and teacher, and I felt, you know, Cooper should pay what he was worth, period. And so that, that was my one little anecdote with, and he was, you know, he was surprised. It was, it was great. And uh, he was truly a dedicated, uh, practitioner of whatever he did. And you know, teaching calligraphy and lettering is, is mis, is unappreciated. And uh, one of the things I did, this is just reflects on, on the whole idea of teaching. I went to Italy finally four years ago or so, and I made a beeline for the Trajan column, right? Yes. He's nodding. Yes. Because one of the courses I took with, uh, Paul Standard and Phil Grushkin, I forget who did it was, the whole study of the, of the, 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 the Roman letters at the Trajan Column, Hadrian's story. And I just want to tell, for designers and artists here, if you want to really understand two-dimensional design, study that ca the, the capital letters of Roman design. I actually draw them for, to relax because they are such, they're so pure in two-dimensional design. And then if you want to really have fun, make yourself some plaster of Paris things and draw them and carve them as fun. Anyway, <laughs> I, I, I just wanted to say that uh, Don Kunz was one of those people which is characteristic, who is characteristic of Cooper Union. Because I, I went to Cooper Union, I met my wife there, my niece went there, my brother went to Cooper. So, you know, the whole family had benefited from Peter Cooper's vision and from the wonderful community that this has been all these years. And I just, I'm, I'm grateful for it. Yes. While, while I'm walking there, I'll say that I have, 
I don't have FOMO, fear of missing out. I have frustration at having missed out after hearing all this. I'm like, I wish I could have taken, I should have taken Don's courses back then. I wish he was still with us. I just have a quick question. Is calligraphy still part of Cooper Union's curriculum? Does anyone know? I would think so. It's uh, I don't think it's required anymore mm -hmm. as it once was. It's not, not required. Uh, but I do, I think, so? I'm pretty sure I saw it listed in the catalog. Yeah. <laughs> it is, yeah. yeah. It's yeah. not. It's yeah. not listed? Not? Or is, it is. I, I think it is. Oh, it is. Yeah. It is. Yeah, yeah. oh that's good. E <laughs> e yes, there's a, there, e um, the Cooper type program and the Lou Ballin Center do an excellent job at promoting the importance of handwriting of uh, lettering and of uh, alphabet making, yeah, they which show is, it. and they show it also. Um, uh, and the idea of writing is so important that part of keeping Don's name vibrant is also to keep the importance of writing vibrant with the taking of calligraphy and also uh, my work with Ellen Lupton, which called for a lot of writing. I was really surprised at the end of four years that I was much more, let's say, uh, developed as, I'd become more developed as a writer than I uh, had expected to. I thought I would be more uh, drawing and painting, um, but the, uh, the opening up of writing, with the physicality of it, thanks to Don, and the intellectuality of it, thanks to the other uh, uh, design program leaders, uh, was very special. Very high values at Cooper Union. Mm. Very high. Thank you. Oh. Okay, right. Uh, Bernard would like to add, add something. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. So I transferred into Cooper Union in 1974, and I had been an obsessive calligrapher for many years in high school and the years before. And when I first met Don, I brought all these examples of my work. He looked at it all and he said, I've never seen anybody who've done, who's done so much work on their own. So I felt really good, all full of myself. And then he says, but I'm still putting you in beginning calligraphy. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, I was deeply offended at that moment. Um, but it was obviously the correct and only thing that he should have done to retrain all my misinterpreted skills, my misinterpreted abilities to see properly, to understand lettering and the architecture of writing. And that began a three year study with Don. Um, I would like to encourage you all to, to listen to the tape because it's something we did almost 50 years ago now. I think I had just graduated and Don was, as many of you have mentioned, like a monk, and I felt myself as one of his main disciples and really devoted myself to studying calligraphy and helping him in any way I could. So I wanted to interview him because I felt he had so much wisdom to talk about. And WBAI, who I had been doing some work for, agreed to record it in their studios. And it's about a 45 minute tape. I'm just asking questions, Don's doing all the answering. But um, it was like done, and I honestly don't recall if it ever actually got played on WBAI, but I had this big like 12 inch reel to reel tape of it, which was misplaced for decades, literally. And then Hurricane Sandy wrecked our home uh, at the Jersey Shore. And while going through moving all the wet, soggy stuff, I came across this tape. And it said, Don Kuhn's interview. And I, I didn't even remember what it was. <laughs> and then listened to it. And it's just filled with jewels of his statements and thoughts and, uh, and all the special things about him. And like the person in uh, the island in 
Liz, where is it? Liz, Liz. You hear him and you think he's there talking to you. So it's, it's really a very wonderful piece of, of history with Don. Thank you, Bernard. <laughs> One more short, we have as much time. Hi, I, I just wanted to know if any of you, any of you are um, willing to teach an adult workshop in calligraphy because I, I took calligraphy many years ago with Maria and you know, just watching this, it would be great if we could do that. I'll, I'll say that speaks to my point about being frustrated at having missed out. This is my opportunity. Yeah, so I second, I second that. I, there are so many great calligraphy teachers out there in New York and in other parts of the, of the U.S. And, and I wasn't even aware. Yeah, that's on my radar. Yeah, the Society of Scribes right. is the right. best resource Go to for the you. Website for the um, and you will see some incredible teachers. Um, and Pinto in the audience over there, mm -hmm. fantastic teacher. You should hook up with her later. The, the beautiful woman with the blue hair. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think. There are, there are a ton of great. Um, the, the, calligraphy is alive and well throughout the US and beyond. And if you are passionate, interested, you can pursue it in your own hometown. But there's really great community of calligraphers that are still alive and kicking. We never got Meliz back on the screen for Zoom. I apologize. Um, I, I have my own mic now. Uh, I. I think we could wrap up unless there are any other questions. Anybody have anything else to add? It's been just a, a really wonderful night. I really would like to thank Sue Gusso, Robert O'Connor, Jerry Kelly, Maria Judis, and our MVP, star mm -hmm. MC of the night is Kelly Acusio Zach. And Mark Vasquez, thank you so much. And Meliz. <laughs> All right. Thank you all and good night. My, my pleasure. <laughs>